Hello, welcome to my channel on chemistry lessons. Um, please hit that subscribe button, go ahead. We're up to 55 now. Let's see how far we can get this. Um, but those of you who've seen other videos, you'll, you'll realize that these focus on mostly AQA, A level chemistry, and the BTEC applied science. So, this is a BTEC applied science lesson. It's part of the assessment objective A2. Now, if that doesn't make much sense to you, I suggest that whilst you're revising and working, that you do have specification in front of you. So, for example, this is unit one, um, which is a first year unit, and there are three assessment objectives, A, B and C, for chemistry, biology and physics. And for chemistry, there are two objectives, A1 and A2. And this is lesson four um, from the second assessment objective, A2. So there's the chemistry assessment objectives, A1 and A2. And we have been looking now down assessment objective two. So this is the A2 list. Not the full list, but the first three lessons of this series, we've already looked at the first ionization energy. We've looked at the trends in ionization energy. We've looked at electron affinity, atomic radius, ionic radius, and electronegativity. So other lessons up to this point have looked there. So this, this, this video, this lesson, is going to focus on the last three. The types of bonding in elements, trends in melting point and boiling point, and then the physical properties of metals. So let's look at the types of bonding possible in elements then. So we can classify elements as metallic or non-metal. So elements are either metals or non-metals. Now, if the element is a metal, that's fairly straightforward because the bonding has to be metallic bonding. So all metallic elements consist of metallic bonding, which is a strong electrostatic attraction between the C of delocalized electrons and the regular arrangement of positive metal ions which means metals have high melting points. Maybe recall some work from assessment objective one where we looked at metallic bonding. We're also gonna look at metals in a bit more detail later on. So that leaves the non-metals then. So non-metals are going to be held together by covalent bonds. So they're covalent molecules. However, there are two structures of covalent elements. They can either be a giant covalent structure and you've seen this in carbon. And this is a very strong attraction between all atoms. So this requires a lot of energy to break. So a giant covalent structure has a very high melting point. Alternatively, it could be a simple covalent structure where the molecules are only held together by weak van der Waals forces and therefore low melting points. So those are our three structures available and those three structures you do see in assessment objective one and also a little bit in GCSE. Let's now look at the periodic table then and how we can use the periodic table to determine the structure. So we can determine whether it's giant covalent, simple covalent, metallic by looking at the periodic table. So Hopefully we're aware that there's a divide between the metals and the non-metals that starts between boron and aluminium and it runs as a stairway, as a staircase down. So this isn't actually drawn on the periodic table, but you should be aware of where this line is. Okay, so stairway between boron and aluminium and runs down. And in fact, actually, when it comes to the exams, we're only going to focus on the first three periods anyway. Okay, anything to the left of this green line these are our metallic elements. So these will all consist of metallic bonding, as we've seen on the previous page. All metallic elements consist of metallic bonding. So all of these in green, metallic bonding. So you would expect these to have fairly high melting points due to the strong electrostatic attractions between the C of D localized electrons and the regular arrangement of positive metal ions. Now the rest of the periodic table which is the smallest section, as you can see, to the right of that line. These are our non-metals. Now, non-metals are either giant covalent or simple covalent. Now, we just need to know the three structures for giant covalent. You should be aware that carbon is a giant covalent. You'll have done some work on diamond 
and graphite, particularly at GCSE. Carbon is a giant covalent structure, which has a high melting point, very high melting point, because lots of energy is needed to break the covalent bonds in that structure. There are two more giant covalent structures, which is boron and silicon. You need to know that those three elements are giant covalent and therefore have high melting points. And the good news is that all of the others are simple covalent and therefore have weak van der Waals forces between their molecules. So these are our simple covalent. And the red there is our giant covalent. Let's now look then at the melting point of the elements across period two. OK, so we're going to start with lithium. You don't need to memorize these, by the way. You should have access to a periodic table. All I'm doing is I'm literally going across. If you've got a periodic table in front of you, you'll see I'm literally working my way across the second period. Oxygen, fluorine, 10 neon. So as we go from Left to right, we've got lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon. Now, what we're going to do is look at the trend in their melting point. In order to do that, we need to know their structure. Now, hopefully, you've picked up from the last couple of slides that boron and carbon are both going to be giant covalent, which means they have very, very strong bonds holding their structure together and in fact will have the highest two melting points of all of these elements. OK, these have the highest melting points. Then we should identify these two structures as being metallic. So these two structures, lithium and beryllium, are going to be metallic. They will also have high melting points. However, not as high as the giant covalent. So I'm going to put them well, here. So we have a, a general increase look from lithium to beryllium, boron, carbon. And the reason that the boiling point or melting point of boron and carbon is greater than lithium and beryllium is simply because the bonding in the giant covalent is stronger than the bonding in the metallic. So more energy is needed to break those covalent bonds than is needed to break the metallic bonds. Now, the remaining four elements are all simple molecular. These four here are all simple molecules or simple covalent. That means they're only held together by weak van der Waals. So these four are significantly below everything else. I wouldn't worry too much about my trend there as long as you can identify the name of the structure and the type of bonding. So weak van der Waals forces for these four means that they have the weakest melting points and boiling points of all the elements in period two. OK, then, so now let's look at the elements in period three. So this time, instead of looking at period two, I'm going to cross period three, sodium, magnesium, Aluminium, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, and argon. Again, I'm going to identify the structures from what I know in the periodic table. Now, I know that these first four, uh, these first three, sorry, are metals. So they're going to be giant metallic, and they're going to be fairly high. So I'm going to have them fairly high. That's fairly high. I know that silicon is in fact giant covalent, and it's the only one that's giant covalent in period three. So this is a giant covalent, and that has a very high melting point. It's going to be the highest of the lot. We saw this in the last trend in period two, where we had two giant covalent structures, boron and carbon, and they were both the highest. And the final four, these four here, are all simple molecules. 
and therefore have the lowest melting points and boiling points. These are simple molecules. They're only held together by weak van der Waals forces. And I wouldn't worry too much about the trend, but they're all fairly low. They're all fairly low. So you're making a link here between the structure type and the melting point, okay? Right, what you need to do now then is you're going to pause the video and you're going to look at each of these questions and you're going to identify which of the two has the highest melting point and why. So I want an explanation. Pause the video now. Right, okay. So lithium or carbon? First thing we do is we identify the structure. Lithium is metallic, carbon is giant covalent. Giant covalent has stronger bonds, therefore more energy is needed to break them. So the giant covalent in carbon is stronger than the giant metallic in lithium. Question two, boron or N2? Again, we're identifying the structure. Boron is giant covalent, nitrogen is simple molecular. Simple molecular are held together by weak van der Waals, giant covalent are held together by strong covalent, which require lots of energy to break. Boron has the highest melting point out of these two. Next, Be or O2. Well, Be, we look at the periodic table, that's a metal. It's a giant metallic structure, has the fairly high melting points. Oxygen is a simple molecule that's held together by weak van der Waals, so the highest here is Be giant metallic structure. Next, SI or S. SI is a giant covalent structure with strong covalent bonds between all the atoms. Sulfur is a simple molecule with weak van der Waals forces. Therefore, silicon is the highest melting point. Okay, question five is tricky because these are both, S8 and Cl2 are both weak van der Waals, simple molecules. So they're both simple molecules, weak van der Waals. Now, because this is a larger molecule, this has stronger van der Waals. So when it comes to just van der Waals, this is S8, this is Cl2. So S8 has a bigger molecular mass and it will have more electrons and more van der Waals, so S8 in this case. So we're working our way down then. Previous lessons we've looked at these sections. Today we've looked at the type of bonding in the element. Uh, we looked at the three different structures and their trends as we go across those periods. So the last thing for us to do then is to look at the physical properties of metals, okay, in terms of conductivity of electricity and heat, and also them being malleable and ductile. Before we look at these properties, because what we're going to be asked to do is we're going to be asked to link these properties to the structure and the bonding in metals. Now, metallic bonding, I'm going to draw six of the particles here. So I'm drawing six particles of metals, if you like. And what we have is a sea of delocalized electrons. So what happens is the outer shell electrons are, in fact, delocalized and can move. So we've got six electrons here, and I'm just randomly drawing these six electrons. I've got six atoms or ions now, so six positive ions. That's what we call a regular arrangement, a lattice, and we've got a C of delocalized electrons. The term delocalized means the electrons can move. Now that we've recapped the structure of metals, let's look at these four terms, then electrical conductivity, thermal conductivity, and malleable and ductile. Well, the reason I've paired them up is because we can explain both types of conductivity using the same principle, okay? Now, the fact that metals have delocalized electrons, those delocalized electrons can move, and by moving, because they are charged, they can carry the electrical charge, so they can conduct electricity. So metals conduct electricity because they have a sea of delocalized electrons. That's also the reason why they can conduct heat, because they're able to transfer the energy or heat energy. So metals are 
conductors of heat and electricity because of their delocalized electrons that are free to move. And again, for the bottom two here, malleable and ductile, we can use the same principle or the same theory to explain both properties because the properties are very similar. Malleable means it's it can be rolled or bent into sheets, so we can kind of bend it, we can move it, we can change its shape. Ductile means it can be drawn into thin wires. And the reason behind both of them is due to the fact that it's in a regular pattern. So we have a regular pattern. And you can kind of see it as layers. So if you apply, if you were to hit it with a hammer from the side, or if you were to apply a force, the layers can actually slide over each other. Not very easily, but if you apply a force, you can force those layers to move over each other. And that enables you to change the shape. It also enables you to draw them out into thin wires. So ductile means to draw it into thin wires. Malleable is the ability to bend and reshape. Your turn to answer some questions then. So we've got four questions here. So pause the video now, and when you're ready to hear the answers, unpause and check your answers. Okay, number one, explain why magnesium conducts electricity. Well, we're going to say that magnesium has a metallic structure, which has a sea of delocalized electrons, which is free to move and carry the electric charge. In question two, we're given the identical answer. We're saying aluminium is a metallic structure, which has a sea of delocalized electrons, which is free to move and carry the thermal energy. Okay, so the only difference there is what they're carrying. They're carrying thermal energy, it's heat. If they are carrying charge, then it's, it's conductivity of electricity. Number three, iron is often used in construction because it's malleable. What does that mean and why is iron malleable? Well, malleable means that it can be hammered or pressed into shape without breaking. And the reason that iron is malleable is because of the metallic structure, the positive metal ions are in a regular or repeating pattern of layers and if a force is applied the layers can slide over each other so that's why iron is malleable and the exact same answer is given to copper copper is a metallic structure the layers of positive metal ions can be forced to slide over one another and ductile means that you can draw it into thin wires so you can stretch it out into thin wires and that's due to the layers being able to slide over each other. That concludes today's lesson then. Hopefully that was useful. It makes some sense. Don't forget, you know what you're doing. There we are right there. Um, any further videos or any questions you've got, you can pop them in the comments. Get in touch with me. Thanks for watching.